today's topic is going to be uh, about immunotherapy for IVF. Uh, and we are um, going to be talking about the various immunotherapies in a new study where they did a comparison with something called network meta-analysis, which allows you to um, use meta-analysis model to compare different types of uh, treatments amongst each other. Um, so kind of a new uh, process, a new study, um, because it has not been done in the same fashion before. Um, a lot of data, a lot of really interesting stuff, and some very robust numbers, which I have not seen before. So this is kind of interesting for me, um, because some of these things we don't routinely do, but it looks like they may have some significant benefits. So I hope you are all well. Um, I will briefly touch on a topic that people asked us to talk about last week, which was naltrexone for um, fertility. So um, there are very, very few studies of naltrexone for infertility. And uh, most of those studies involve um, doing things like um, uh, PCOS patients and ovulation and so on. So uh, in that scenario, um, none of the uh, um, studies said anything negative. They actually all suggested that naltrexone was beneficial. But there is nothing for naltrexone and IVF. Um, it's only for patients that are doing um, treatment specifically for PCOS and nothing else. Tarek is behind me <laughs> trying to make this work. <laughs> this is absolutely hilarious. Welcome to the modern age of the internet. Um, in any event, um, so what we're going to talk about today is this study. Um, and this was interesting. So uh, this group essentially pulled together a huge number of studies, but they limited it to um, randomized control trials that were involving uh, different types of immunotherapy for patients with recurrent implantation failure. Uh, and um, they started out with over 22,000 articles, which just goes to show how you know, significant a, a problem this is and significant an issue this is. And the uh, fact that um, you were totally on camera the whole time. <laughs> um, and it basically shows everyone, uh, you know, what, what the uh, um, number of trials that they needed to limit it to was. So they ended up with 21 trials at the end of it all. Um, and at the uh, uh, outset of that, they analyzed it and then did comparisons. Um, so just to kind of go through the basics, um, there is a whole school of thought in, in vitro fertilization uh, and fertility that says that the immune system is critically important to success. And there are journals dedicated to this, the Journal of Reproductive Immunology. Um, so there are whole divisions of our science devoted to figuring out how the immune system interacts and how we can modulate it to make it more tolerant of embryo implantation. And then a whole other question of, should we make it more tolerant of embryo implantation? Um, so along the lines of this, pretty much everything in the kitchen sink has been tried to help people with IVF failures. Um, and the first question is, well, what constitutes recurrent implantation failure? So there actually is not a solid, convincing, single definition. Some people will say three embryo transfers. Some people will say three euploid embryo transfers. Other people will say an entire IVF cycle. What probably makes the most sense is that it be some number of known genetically normal embryos um, or some other number if you don't know if they're genetically normal because the normalcy is a whole other argument um, and whether or not we should do PGTA. But basically, we're probably looking at some type of definition. So for this particular study, um, they were a little less specific. They said the inclusion criteria were that it had to be randomized controlled trials, which is good because that's what we really want. It had to be uh, recurrent implantation failures with at least one or more in vitro fertilization embryo transfer failure histories. Essentially, what they looked at was uh, either clinical pregnancy. So they saw, um, they called that uh, defined as evidence of a gestational sac on transvaginal ultrasound, whereas clinical pregnancy is actually a fetal heartbeat. Um, and then they had secondary outcome measures, which were the implantation rate, the live birth rate, 
a miscarriage rate. So right from the get-go, there are some issues we got to look at here, which is the fact that their definition of clinical pregnancy rate is not what everybody else uses, number one. And number two, they use live birth rate as a secondary outcome, whereas live birth rate really should be your primary outcome. So interesting to look at, but nevertheless uh, worthy of, of further analysis. So they started out with 22,855 articles. Um, 99 of those they looked at uh, after screening. 25 studies extra they found through doing additional analysis. And so they finally ended up from all of those with 21 uh, randomized controlled trials that met their criteria and they said these are good. So um, the first thing they analyzed was the primary outcome, which was clinical pregnancy rate. So they looked at nine different treatments. Um, all immunotherapies uh, had at least one placebo controlled trial. So these are trials where they randomly assign women to either getting a placebo or the medication. And none of them involved comparing one immune treatment to another immune treatment. It was immune treatment to placebo. Um, so they didn't necessarily compare those ones together. So when they looked at peripheral blood mononuclear cells, which is where you can fractionate the different groups of cells, and that's what was in our picture on our ad for this show, um, they demonstrated that that actually increased your success by 163%, highly significant. Granulocyte colony stimulating factor, 103%. Intralipids, which are cheap and easy to use and don't cost a fortune, 98%. Um, PRP, 155%, that's platelet-rich plasma. And then this drug called serolimus was 295% higher than normal. So that one seemed to have a huge impact. Um, and it works through this very specific pathway called mTOR, um, T-O-R, and it uh, counteracts something called rapamycin. So it's an interesting drug. Um, it does have significant anti-rejection properties when you're doing uh, transplants and so on. So it's a very reasonable thing to consider when you're doing IVF because the whole theory is that your immune system may reject an embryo because the embryo is only going to be half you, if at all you. And so uh, we need to kind of allow it to adapt to your immune system. Um, so when they looked at it in terms of uh, going into other um, analyses, when they compared it to a different baseline, um, they actually had even more robust responses. So 533% for the PMBCs, um, granulocyte colony, colony stimulating factor was 389%. Um, even HCG had a huge increase in success. That was 384%. Intralipids, 377%. PRP was 515%. And then serolimus, which I'm definitely going to try, 809% uh, increase. I mean, stratospheric numbers, very, very, very significant. Um, when they looked at clinical pregnancy rate, um, they basically did some probability analysis to see how significant these things are. And they said the serolimus was number one, then the PBMCs, the PRP, the GCSF, and then intralipids last. Um, so we do use quite a lot of intralipids. These other things are way more rare and way, way more costly um, and require drawing blood for at least two of them, which are the PBMCs and the PRP. But serolimus we need to look into because if it's not expensive, that may be a very easy, simple way of helping people out. So um, we're going to have to do some serolimus uh, evaluation um, very soon. So basically when they did all of this, they said that there was very good consistency with the results of the network meta-analysis. They were very happy um, with the results and basically said that all of this looked really good. So then they started doing subgroup analysis and they said, what if we actually take women that have more than three failures so that it's not just one failure, it's several failures, which obviously is a lot of the patients out there because most people are not diving into immune therapy after just one failure. So when they did that, they said that the PBMCs, the peripheral blood mononuclear, mononuclear cells, had a 201% increase. The GCSF had a 120% increase. PRP was still a huge increase, 286%. And again, serolimus was 295%, kind of dwarfing all the others. All of them very, very successful. 
Um, they did say that the PRP was better than the intralipids. Um, they kind of went into detail with that. So they said that it looked like when you did the probability, PRP actually had um, quite a, a strong impact when they did the probability assessment, even stronger in the probability assessment than the serolimus. So PRP is platelet-rich plasma. This is where we can extract the um, uh, platelet-rich portion of your plasma, um, kind of compact it in a centrifuge, and then take that and inject it into the uterus. So they are suggesting that for patients with recurrent implantation failure, the PRP has a very, very significant uh, impact if you've had more than three failures. So that's huge. They then went even further and they said, what about looking at frozen embryo transfers, which we do quite a bit of mostly. Um, and so they looked at nine different uh, studies that involved that um, using five different treatments. So the PBMCs, 156% improvement, PRP, 148%. Um, those were quite significant. The other ones did not show significance. So in the frozen embryo transfers, they were really looking at these blood product approaches to things. There was not one for the serolimus, although I do think it looks like it's very worthwhile. When they looked at secondary outcomes, so all of the other things that they were evaluating, <clears throat> they said that the live birth rate, um, the PBMCs and serolimus were actually the ones that showed a difference in live birth rate. And since that's the real holy grail, that's the one we should really be focusing on, less so than the clinical pregnancy rate. So serolimus, again, seems to be this like wonder drug that we really do need to take a look at. Um, they did mention as well that uh, the other ones also helped, but not quite as much. Um, including intralipids, which with our experience, we use frequently because we've seen improvements. Miscarriage rate actually was not um, affected by any of the drugs that were used. Um, so in sum, uh, essentially when they went through all of this, they're finding that there are immune modulations that can be done that will help with the outcome of your treatment if you are uh, having immune-based problems or recurrent failures. Um, a lot of the patients I talk to these days are coming to us from the web, and they're from all over the world, frequently Australia, Europe, um, the UK, where they've tried many, many, many times. In particular, Australia I had one patient I spoke to just the other night who had tried nine previous cycles, um, and they're having failures. And those patients are patients that almost undoubtedly have some component of immune problem, because realistically, if you're putting in genetically normal embryos, um, as we've talked about on the show before, there's a very good study by Richard Scott's team that shows that 95.2% of patients will succeed after three euploid embryo transfers. So if you're failing after three euploid embryo transfers, something undoubtedly is wrong and needs to be very carefully looked at. And this may be a big part of what that is. So what sort of things can we use? It looks like the PBMC transfusion or, or injection, PRP injections, intralipids, um, serolimus, all of these do appear to have pretty strong evidence because they're coming from randomized controlled trials that they could be potentially beneficial. I definitely will try the serolimus shortly. We just have to see how much that stuff costs. I don't know if you have time to look that up while we're discussing this, but it's S-I-R-O-L-I-M-U-S. See if you can find a cost for that. I'd be very, very interested to know. Uh, so is it a fact or fiction that immune therapies um, can impact things? It is a fact. It does appear that immune therapies can have a huge impact. And are those uh, things that we can modify for you? Yeah, they are. Um, which ones seem to work? Um, it seems like serolimus and PRP and PBMCs have the strongest impact, but intralipids also seems to have a, an impact, and even HCG therapy seems to have an impact. Do you find anything? How much do I want to know? <laughs> Pack of 30, average cost for 30 tablets. So yeah. 511 less. Well, that's not bad. I mean, compared to what people are paying for this yes. stuff, that's like completely reasonable. Okay. So um, my uh, Apple Watch is telling me that the battery is dead. So you know what? Um, we're going to go to live questions now. So uh, thank you for watching that part of the show. Um, we love uh, taking care of that. Make sure you uh, comment, make sure you share, 
and make sure you uh, um, subscribe um, in particular on our YouTube channel, which seems to grow no matter what we do. And please yourselves and your friends share and uh, comment and like and subscribe to uh, Instagram, Facebook and so on. We uh, we're always happy to grow.